This is Dan Schneider on this Dan Schneider video interview. The subject is Marshall McLuhan. I will be discussing his life and his work with Derek DeKerkov, an expert on McLuhan, and the conversation will begin in a moment. The subject is Marshall McLuhan. The man before you is not McLuhan, but Derek DeKerkov. He has written extensively about McLuhan. Uh, and so I'd like to just ask a little bit about who Derek DeKerkov is before we talk about McLuhan and his ideas. So if you could just give me a minute or two uh, or so, a uh, background about who you are and anything you've written about uh, McLuhan. Go ahead, Derek. Great. Well, I am now um, a journalist living in Rome, but uh, for 45 years I was a professor at the University of Toronto first uh, basically teaching French, and then after 1981, uh, uh, anything wrong? No, I'm, no I, I, I just have two computers, so I'm looking at information for the future. All yeah. right, I didn't know what you got. <laughs> no. All right, I'll back to you. So that um, after, after uh, it's the 1980, being very involved with becoming Progressively, the director, co-director, and then director of the McLuhan program. Um, I was indeed very uh, honored, and excited to be able to do that because McLuhan was my very first illumination at the university world. I mean, like it was amazing to have a professor who talked about your own time in my field, anyway, in uh, and and did it in in a kind of a <laughs> Real time way. He was very, and he was incomprehensible. So I've spent a good deal of my life in uh, translating McLuhan in English, for me anyway. Uh, but actually, he is very comprehensible now and he doesn't need translation anymore. So um, I, have, uh, I have translated books of his from cliche to archetype, which was an exciting experience. And we did it somehow together as well. He uh, he was very he was very pleased that he said the translation was better than the original, which was sweet. Uh -huh. But I think what he meant was that he had been able to to to, to change some of the things he had written first, uh, add stuff. We added to that that book was written. It was published in a uh, alphabetical order, so all the chapters were just followed in alphabetical order, which was to breaking down any kind of continuity. From one chapter to another, or any attempt to do so, a, a, a hypertext, a linear hypertext, to be, to be precise. Uh, and I had, I had suggested we had the uh, dictionnaire des idées reçues of uh, Flaubert, which, uh, which uh, is, is basically a bunch of cliché that his contemporary used to babble about, and uh, he used to be enraged, so he just made a list. This is Gustave Robert. He made a list of all these cliches at the end of a satire about the bourgeois, little petite bourgeois kind of society in his contemporary Paris. And so that dictionary is, is in the dream. It seems like it's proving the true point at every word. So, yeah, it was fun to do that. And, uh, and yeah, being a student was a bit baffling, but uh, being a collaborator. Well, for those who may not know, since uh, McLuhan's been dead for almost four decades now, um, let, let's talk a little bit about who the man was and his import. Uh, before we get into any biographical things, uh, I was born in 1965, so I remember even in junior high school in the late 70s having to know about McLuhan uh, as a media guru. Obviously, his most famous uh, expression is the medium is the message. Uh, but it seems to me that nowadays in the 21st century, where McLuhan had maybe a 20 or so year period after his death where he was sort of fell into uh, disuse or uh, from the academia's point of view, he's had a re-rise. Whereas other people like, say, Alvin Toffler, who just recently died a year or so ago with Future Shock, seem to still be sort of a thing of the past. What do you think has made uh, someone like McLuhan more relevant today Whereas people like Toffler and some other people from the 60s and 70s, uh, their work seems more dated. Well, to use his language, I would say they were, they were just being the figures. 
and he was looking at the ground. And so the ground was electricity, and the figures were all the events that would happen in the economy or in the uh, in industry or, in fact, in politics. They were good ideas. There's no question about it. Uh, I like Dr. Rowe. I thought he was very good. But he was, he hadn't hit the ground. McLuhan always hit the ground. He started with the ground. And so the ground for him was electricity. Right? So uh, digital culture is nothing but an extension of electricity. For the moment, it might be something else later, but for the moment, it is still entirely dependent on electricity. And he was a wizard of electricity, McLuhan. He had, he had gotten electricity as if he had made it himself. All its characteristics, its types, uh, how it transformed people's sensibilities. He, he had it all down pat. So, uh, so I think that, that that's the kind of that's a kind of inspiring uh, thinking that he was uh, he was he was capable of giving you. He was a really and it's funny because he always made he made jokes. Some of them were terrible. He was always making jokes, uh, but in between the jokes, he was you know letting go absolutely amazing things that I only began to understand towards the second year. Well, um, let me ask about uh, uh, his background, and then we'll get back to. <laughs> because in fact, he wanted me to, to, to say. Why is it relevant? Why is it still relevant now? I explained that to a certain point. But I think the other thing is, we are only now uh, turning another twist to our evolution that is now escaping slightly McLuhan. Only now. Which is that McLuhan did not bother with social media. He had no clue about that. Yeah. As far as I know, I have not seen in McLuhan a reference to social media. But he did say that, you know, in the in the in the future, half the world would be you know, uh, spying upon the other half and forging on him. <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. So clearly, he had already an idea that we would all be connected. But I don't think he recognized that he predicted social media as as such. So I think that's going to make him less relevant for a while. Then he'd be relevant again. Yeah, uh, I've often thought that. Uh that uh, McLuhan has uh, had some interesting ideas about the fact that human beings evolved a certain way so where that mass media can influence them in certain ways. And for example, in the field of artificial intelligence, scientists are thinking about uh, that if computers are to get to an artificially intelligent state, that they have to be more human-like in terms of embodiment, you know, building robots that, uh, that look and think and feel like human beings. And to me, that seems something that McLuhan, uh, his work, uh, it may not have been based on it or, or predicted it, but that that's something that that uh, has its roots in uh, McLuhan's ideas. Because in order to to get things, art, robots or, or androids to think like us, they have to be influenced in the same ways. They just can't be a disembodied voice. They have to have bodies. They have to have be able to see things. They have to be able to hear things, have, have sensory input. Uh, do you think that uh, McLuhan's uh, ideas about how human beings are affected by things outside, by the mass media, has uh, relevance in the age of artificial intelligence? In two ways, at least. Um, first of all, he's what I call his decalogues, when he predicts that the next medium will be an extension of consciousness, uh, to the extent that artificial intelligence is going to be involved more and more in uh, with big data and other contemporary um, tracing, collecting, cross cutting <laughs> material via the internet. Um, this would actually um, oh, I forgot that I've lost my I've lost my uh, my train of thought. Okay. So I've lost my train. I'll see you another question. I've, I've okay. really, it'll come back. It's the, well, yeah, I was basically just asking about uh, how McLuhan's idea of him, uh, uh, of 
human beings being affected by mass media uh, and embodiment in AI, and you were talking about uh, that the next extension of media would be consciousness. Yes, that's right. The first, the first thing being the extension of the, of the mind, that's mm -hmm. what I was going to say, and then the second one being the extension of the body. And what you were talking about, of course, is that, you know, basically, when you think about tools, they at, one, at some point, they lose your hand. They, they literally, you don't have to have, use your hand to deal with them anymore. But the more that, the more they your hand, the more autonomous they have to be. For one thing, so the autonomy requires that they actually are programmed in ways that are for us predictable, and and and, uh, and, and somehow. By the way, the the best example of this is the anxiety over uh, self-driving cars. I'm yeah. talking about vanity, even not in the night there, but. The self-driving car has to absolutely not only predict everything that could possibly happen in, uh, in the context of, of driving, but also avoid, uh, also see in every possible way its presence without being intrusive of course, to, uh, to the community. So it's a very interesting thing that the dialogue that has to be established between uh, users and their robots and their artificial intelligence are indeed projected outside. But what did McLuhan say? He said that we would be, that mankind was actually uh, being turned inside out like a glove. He used the expression, like a glove. So I, I think that he really uh, got that very clearly. Uh, and but I, don't, I don't know how to say, I don't know whether I would have a lot to learn, even in robotics. He, you know, uh, the complexity of robotics, artificial intelligence, and the enormous quantity of data available in that together, assuming that eventually we can integrate, and I think that's something we're going towards, uh, then we're in a situation that, I don't know, um, goes, goes beyond the uh, the mayor projection issue, where we somehow, it's hard to say, it's, it's a very strange way of, of being, uh, which we, are, we already are experiencing. And the fact that we are traced everywhere and we are positioned everywhere, and there is that whole environment that hugs you with all its content, uh, that's a situation that's already quite far from the ordinary, you know. It's, it brings you back. Uh, to the story of the Indian who was uh, guiding, you probably heard this guy if you talked about McLuhan because he was a friend of McLuhan, uh, the Indian who was guiding uh, a friend, Michael Smart, who helped him to name the north of Toronto, the name of the lakes and the rivers and things. And at one point, as the guide is moving and they're all walking in this woods, uh, at one point, uh, the uh, the guy, the guy uh, says to him, it's getting late. And so Michael says, okay, let's go back. And then the guy is looking and very, very, seems to be in anxiety, and have some anxiety. And uh, so Michael says, to, see, uh, are we lost? And the guy said, no, no, the village is lost. So that's a, that's a, a reversal of spatial relationship, which is exactly uh, what is happening to us now. We're now, we're now in a position where we don't move, the, the world moves uh, through us, as, as, as would be the, the case for that Indian guy. Well, let me uh, uh, ask, let, let's just go back to the beginning, uh, uh, who McLuhan was, because uh, he was born over a century ago in 1911 in Edmonton, uh, Alberta, from what I uh, read. And so what kind of uh, family life did he have? Was it, were his parents... Uh, uh, artists, were they uh, scientists, or what? Did he just come from a middle class background? And what was his early life like? Uh, and cause... Uh, uh, yeah, I, I would have thought other people would have told you this. Uh, yes, he had, a, he had a very interesting education. I think uh, his father, I can't remember the father's job, uh, uh, but the, the real strong person in the family was clearly the mother. Elsie, Elsie Hall, Elsie McLuhan. She was an artist. She was a committed artist. She was uh, uh, an imp 
impersonator. She would go from church to church and pretend to be somebody else. And a preacher. And she was good at it. She was actually very well known. And, uh, but the more issue, the commitment to, to, for, from her love of English, English literature, she knew it all. She had to recite it in, in her. And uh, so from the time he was four, Marshall would be sat there in the room while he was getting ready. And she would recite to him by heart. Uh, passages of Milton, Matthew uh, 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 Henry Dickinson, whatever. She, he, she was trained in poetry uh, from his mother. And his great, great love for English language, his adoration for puns, uh, his extremely good memory for uh, large content or large segments of the poetry. And he was very convincing when he was giving a back to you. He was great at, at reading. I think he had to read them, the Ten Thunders of uh, Joyce, because uh, I think it's great, you know, the Thunders. <laughs> I couldn't do it. I couldn't even do it if I had it on my, you know, I couldn't do it. It was very funny at that, uh, in these cases, yeah. Well, uh, let's talk about uh, his education, though, uh, more specifically. What the field uh, did he study in, and uh, how did he develop some of his early ideas that later came to fruition? Uh, well, he studied English literature, and he studied English literature. Every day, a page and a half of a large Oxford English dictionary. Oh. And worked with, he had it with, <laughs> he had it with a, a steak and three eggs. You know, he come from the prairies. So, anyway, um, so, uh, oh, no, where, I'm sorry, where was I again? I, I, I was just I, asking about uh, his, his formal education and. Uh, uh, you know, where his future ideas came from, what were the seeds? Yeah, no, no. So, uh, so he, uh, once he's at the University of Manitoba, I think, and he's along, he's along with um, a friend, uh, Tom Easterbrook, and they are at a book store, and they both separate and look at different sectors of the bookstore and then when they come back they find themselves at the cashier and uh, Easterbrook has in his hand what's wrong with the world from um, what's wrong with the world uh, from uh, Chest Chesterton, J.K. Chesterton and uh, in the clue of all things had in hand um, a precy of economics. I said, they look at each other. And Marshall had the precy of economics, and, he, and, and, and the Tom Easterbrook had the other book. And they look at each other and said, this is more like your kind of stuff, and exchange books. Buy them both, both of them buy. So it's funny that in, in some way they were, they were handing destiny to each other, right? One becomes one of the best economists of the University of Toronto, Tom Easterbrook. From receiving that book from the McClellan becomes a convert from reading Chesterton. So we're talking real influences, like right, you know. So we're only at the beginning here, and what McClellan then does is uh, uh, finish his brilliantly studies at Manitoba, and then it goes off to uh, Cambridge, and uh, in Cambridge get acquainted with uh, F.R. Leibniz, um, I.A. Richards, on new criticism, new criticism yeah. but that kind of the early rounds of new criticism. Uh, meanwhile, he's also on the Thomas Nash and the, the learning of his time, which then makes me go to the history of learning with his thesis. Uh, yeah, and uh, then uh, how did he get? Yeah, he gets he gets the job. His first job when he comes 
described from England is University of Madison at Wisconsin. And there he finds that he's got trouble in explaining Matthew Arnold and all the big English, you know, poets and others, and, and, and simplest, he also like the French poets. He finds it's hard to explain that to the students. And so they're not in it. They don't get, they don't, it's their thing. But he starts listening to what they are talking about and realizes that television and advertising are the content of their reference world. And that's when he began to study. This, he tries to help his students to understand, he helps himself to understand, he helps his students to understand their own contemporary uh, law, folklore, what industrial man, as the mechanical pride was called. So uh, he, he gets into that, and that's the first step. And then the second step is, uh, I, I guess, I can't remember now, but the, the, the Gutenberg Galaxy comes first, or National Education, the National Broadcaster, Educational Broadcaster of America. He was commissioned to do a job on explaining television, radio, and media to, uh, again, to educational, for an educational program. And he made a very, very beautiful and quite tight analysis that became Understanding Media. And I think that was written before uh, Good Galaxy. So, Understanding media, I think, and, and we can come to influences of other other writers who influenced him, which we can talk about. But but understanding media, I think, is a is a hinge. Um, he he explained to me that the good word, the, the thing wrong with with the mechanical pride. Was that uh, it was it had a, it had a moral it was a, it was a satire yes but it had a moralist stance and as far as he was concerned he did not like the moralist stance that he had taken in the mechanical pride which was his first book I'm just, say. Yeah? I'm just just so people know that was his first book published in 1951 that's right that's right. Um, Yes, now I remember the interaction, the articulation of the Gutenberg Galaxy. The Gutenberg Galaxy came as a kind of a homage to uh, Harold Innes. Harold Innes, that who McLuhan knew and had encountered in a rather disaster uh, first meeting arranged by Tom Easterbrook, in fact. Uh, and the problem was that, that uh, Guinness was an atheist, a, a committed atheist, and of course McLuhan was a Catholic convert. So, and they started talking about the, the Spanish Inquisition. It didn't go very well. <laughs> so, so, so they did, it, you know, they would meet occasionally because both of them were interested in ideas, and at that time people who had ideas did meet. Uh, so, but they didn't, there wasn't work. Well. After Innes died, McLuhan, for chance, discovered that the mechanical bride had been put on the reading list of, of, uh, of, of Harold Lee student, and he was stunned that he would be included after not a you know, auspicious beginnings. He was just very surprised hmm. that uh, he was in the reading list of the many students. So he thought, okay. I'm going to read him. And so he read the bioscope of communication of uh, Harold Linnis, and that really threw him in the right direction for studying media. Because uh, what he had what he had realized uh, in in, the, in in that book uh, was the ground issue. It was a ground issue, the ground issue that was very much explained by Innes uh, in the bias of communication. Uh, and so that was, a, that was the explosion. I think that was the time when the media
media as content and media as uh, support becomes critical for him because it's not about the effect of various means of communication. Uh, in his book, it's all about different effects of media, all the way to radio and Hitler, but starting with Bachman Kill Cultures, uh, particularly a very brilliant uh, fourth chapter, which is about the, the, the resistance of the Greek resistance of or orality to the rival of, of literacy, which was a ground again of McLuhan's thinking. So here he's getting meshed into this world of the studies, and then whatever, however that happened, I don't know, but then he was commissioned that book that became Understanding Media. I, I don't think, I don't think he had any idea that, you know, he, he was going to become as famous. I don't think he did. I know that he was ambitious. That was clear. He made it clear to his mother. Well, Derek... Uh, he was ambitious of... Derek, Derek, let me just, before, before we go off uh, and talk about Understanding Media, which was his most famous book, let me just ask you a little bit about uh, uh, McLuhan's ideas about technology and morality. You mentioned that he was a convert to Catholicism, and you mentioned that he uh, didn't like his first books uh, moralizing so much, yet he's also well known uh, for his stance that media had no inherent uh, ethical or moral bias, that it was just a tool. Uh, how did he reconcile his own uh, ethical or religious moral belief systems with the idea that technology, the media, is inherently neutral ethically? I'm not sure that, I'm not sure that I, I follow you on the essentially neutral business. I mean, he, I don't think he ever thought any medium was no. neutral. No, I don't think it, I don't think no. I, I'm afraid I, I'm surprised to hear you. You may have information that I don't have, but one thing for sure, when he says the medium is mystery, he really means that what's happening to you as you're handling the medium, whatever it is, the pen or mm. the screen or a photograph, uh, you are conditioned in a certain fashion. And if the medium surrounds you completely and traces you, you are, you know, when the, the, ele the uh, electronic straight jacket. Um, so no, the medium is never, for me the medium is never innocent, far from it. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but, but because people don't pay attention to it, they, people concentrate on the content, which, yes, every now and then has its own kind of, you know, a causal value, and, you know, or, or it, uh, instruction content. Uh, but the medium is dom dominates entirely the structure of uh, not not just thinking, uh, but also the, the whole social that comes out from that scene. Just think about how today, for example, the internet is is, is uh, stealing our memory. The way you know mm. we're back to the old argument. That's a very strong way by which the medium is affecting whether you know whatever it is that we are commission committing to our hard disk uh whatever it is pixelation it is makes no difference it's what it's a fact that we don't have it anymore it's now something outside and we have to reconnect with and, you know so yeah the medium um you know, my own work uh, was in fact to prove McLuhan right about the fact that literacy had completely transformed uh the Greek world from tribal to pre-civilized, so to speak. Uh, it, it's, and, no, and then all the content in the world. Look, I, I discussed the matter with Jacques Derrida and Michel Foucault. I mean, these were big stars of the French intellectual, the call, I call them French intellectual terrorists. Both of them didn't have a clue about the effect of the alphabet as alphabet. They had, uh, on the fact that it was literacy as opposed to orality, they didn't care. Mm -hmm. For them, whatever conceptual thinking they brought, it had nothing to do with this sort of, with this sort of thing. Uh, and and uh, I remember when I saw, you know, Fou I remember particularly Foucault uh, coming out of a talk about autobiography and uh, using St. Augustine's confession 
And then, what I also see, but the fact that we're talking about Rafi, forget about Otto, what kind of complicity is between a, se you know, a self to, 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 to narrate his or her story and the uh, uh, and, and, and the writing system, graphy, biography. So he was like, he looked at me and he, he thought the guy is completely out of his tree. Mm -hmm. And, you know, whereas McLuhan made it perfectly clear that that was the ground of the Western culture, Western literacy. He even told me one day that one of the biggest questions for him was to understand, the biggest historical question was to understand why Christ had arrived at a time when the phonetic alphabet was beginning to mature. That's a question he raised twice, at least twice, and maybe third time it's really stuck. I wonder if that's the I, I wonder if that's the cause of the line. There's a there was a, a play, you know, Jesus Christ Superstar, and one of the questions in the main song is, you know, Jesus, why did you come to Israel in four BC where there was no mass communication? You know, <laughs> <laughs> it's good. I love it. I mean, yes, you could be right. You could be right that there is a connection there. Certainly, it would be enormously important to hear that suggestion. Yeah. He loves those. Well, let me just ask about his most famous book, 1964's Understanding Media. And uh, would it be fair to say, do you think that McLuhan felt that media is sort of, sort of plays an evolutionary role in modern man? Hard to know. It's hard to know how evolutionary you would consider it. I don't think he was that impressed with any theory of evolution. I think he was more concerned about, you know, yes, our transformation. But it was not like a thing. I don't remember him theorizing about it. Unless, unless, yes, unless you say that the great divide between the pre-literate and the post-literate and then the pre-electric and the post-electric were uh, a kind of... The only thing I would say was that, 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 I, that connects with this in some fashion would be that he said that uh, people, war was a form of education. People got into war situations when they were sufficiently discom uh, discomfortable or, or greedy or whatever it is, but at a certain moment you would have war, a war situation. Um, that would be an educational kind of, uh, would be an educational moment, mm. which is, when you think about it, quite, quite frightening. Uh, because, of course, all of the good of the American industry and technology has come from the building and the promoting of uh, commercial commercialized industry. The economy comes after the war because of all kinds of innovations are put into play and then become part of a cycle, a market cycle. Well, Derek, let me ask uh, you. Let me ask you about uh, what the major thesis of understanding media was, and why, in 1964, when the book was published, what? Why do you think the book took off so much? Because McLuhan basically went from you know a, a fairly well-known uh, writer on media, but that book had a transformative effect and made him sort of a, a, a darling of, uh, you know, academia, uh, of the media he was on when I was a, a young boy all the time. Of the media, for sure, but not at all of academia. Yeah. No, if anything, if anything sort of explains the dismal uh, neglect that uh, the University of Toronto uh, had after he died of his of continuing uh seriously his work and really using the name to make to make things happen uh, no i don't think so i think the jealousy of many that i heard personally that i was a witness to was clear i'm not going to tell stories or give names but it's quite clear that people did not like him at the university because he was doing too well and he was having so much fun mm -hmm. that's clear um but he took it all in his stride. I found that he was he was he was very naive about it in some fashion. He was charming about it. I don't think he took, I don't think he took himself from McLuhan. Mm -hmm. 
and he really he was modest in his way and and, and didn't didn't take himself too seriously and so that didn't seem to me to be evident anyway i used to i, I knew, knew him personally quite well because i used to drive him home a lot and then that was the only time when you could really grab him and have a, a real chat right uh and we did we had a lot of really interesting ones and uh, among those i began to sort of get to know him more as a as a daily person than a star and it was fun well do you and think I, i enjoyed it i thought it, it was quite amusing he wasn't very very long not mm. the kind but he was always uh interesting and always you know, always, you know trying to tell you trying to teach you something and There was always something worth learning. Well, let me just ask you, um, because it came out in 64, right at the time when the 1960s basically happened post uh, John F. Kennedy's assassination, uh, I mean, he was a darling of certainly uh, the anti-war movement. He was, uh, uh, I mean, he, along with maybe Herman Hesse's uh, novels, uh, everyone in the 1960s, especially young people who were going to college, uh, uh, knew McLuhan. Uh, What do you think was about the zeitgeist of that era that he connected with? Um, an economist would say that the economy itself was actually flourishing and expanding, and more and more people were getting access to a, re a reasonably comfortable life. So there was a kind of relaxation, which, which tightened the, around the Vietnam War, but by and large, uh, It was a it was an era of promise and some somehow people realized that the old manners, the old system, the old attitudes were not really working very well anymore. And uh, the people began to <laughs> let it all hang up. <laughs> That's what they used to say. So uh, I that kind of made Also, probably, how do I say it? Uh, it's, it's, it's as if the interval between disciplines, uh, uh, arts, uh, even political events, okay, all of these intervals have become larger. You could start navigating into a larger world than the rather narrow focus of the 50s, for example, of which the beating generation, you know, escaped. Uh, so there was, <laughs> let me all hang out, does actually reflect something that happened uh, in the business world, happened in the government, happened, of course, in the educational system, uh, allowed much more traveling Uh, in various ways, traveling either within or without, as the crew had pointed out, TV is like a drug, you travel within. Uh, these, these were, and of course, the crew does say television played an enormous role. People were actually really turned on by television, and they were actually very much, uh, very much that. Yeah, you remember, Cluan used to that uh, the, the common thing between the hula hoop and uh, electricity, and particularly television, is that all of them are enveloping you. The hula, the hula hoop was, remember that was also a, a thing of that time, um, creating your own space. Uh, there was all kinds of things at the time that were actually looking forward quite sort of, you know, the world's actually improving rather. It's very different from the way we feel now. I mean, you know, worldwide we're in a situation that, that's, that was uncontrollable. Even during the Vietnam War, there was an enormous, uh, I would say, it was a continuous enthusiasm for other things, obviously, but also a commitment, a form of ideology, a form of, uh, you know, getting into something and trying to mean something socially. That uh, is, uh, I'm afraid, not quite as present today. So, um, maybe I'll come back, who knows, for the time being, things are not looking good at all. Okay. Well, let me ask you about... Uh Uh, he, he wrote a, a few other books, but I wanted to talk about one other book uh, that, that I think isn't talked about as much, and that was 1970s from Cliché to Archetype. Um, 
what what was the main thesis of that book? Because I think that's one of his more important works as well. I mean, he did books on uh, the global village. That's a, he, he coined that term, I believe. But I wanted to talk about uh, from cliche to archetype. Uh, uh, can you tell me a little bit about what that book's uh, major thesis was? Well, it was really a book that attempted to uh, probe the work of the artist. How does the artist, um, how does the artist create work? And there was contemporary of artists who used daily life things like Andy Warhol did, or Class Open, which is a huge hamburger, uh, who who would smash, would be in your face. They would just smash you in your face the the the, the image which had become such a cliche that you had let it to the side by highlighting them, which then you would generate what he called an archetype. Uh, and it, it, it was a very interesting way of approaching various strategies, uh, like quoting uh, an artist, an artist uh, quoting another artist. But, uh, for example, one less example of how uh, you rub you rub two cliches together. You take uh, Salvador Dali, uh, Madonna, and uh, you make it explode into an architecture. Explode into an architecture block. You, you completely expand it. That's that's highlighting a cliche. That's just putting it on steroids, so to speak. And that's what the artist was doing in those days. So he was very, and he was keen on the artist. He thought the artist was the only person lived in their own time, and who understood it and handled it, uh, and handled it better for like trends or, or anybody. He said the only person has perception who, who lives in the present. So uh, that was another big, very big insight. Mm -hmm. So the cliché to archetype was the various ways by which artists would take clichés, and he was very keen on Joyce, full of, full of Joyce uh, uh, quotes in the cliché to archetype, because Joyce was making <laughs> things clash in a, in a single pun. Mm -hmm. It was like rubbing literally two banal ideas, two concepts, uh, uh, in, into in together. So, for example, the, the, the aunt and the grace opera, right? That's the ant and the grasshopper story. Yeah. But the aunt is a, it's a word that he brought together from German, the essence, that is the being, aunt, the aunt, the be, and the grace hopper, uh, the person who's hoping for grace. These are the kind of things that fascinated McLuhan made him uh, like enormously uh, Joyce and quote Joyce all the time. So the book, and he was influenced also by the French symbolist poetry. Uh, he was very keen on Poe, Edgar Allan Poe. Uh, Marshall was a, you have to remember, he was teaching poetry well at the university. He was not just teaching media. He had a, we had the, the Monday night courses, which was about media, culture, and technology, but uh, the, uh, the other course is a course on poetry, and actually he wrote several books of essays and books about poetry, teaching poetry. For, he did, those are mostly unknown. So, uh, this, uh, and, and always this professor, he's keen about his students, he really wants to help them to understand, he's very serious about uh, getting to be understood and making the rather than being understood, forcing the students to understand the world in which they, they are. That was the, that was the purpose of his teaching. Um, so uh, teaching poetry uh, was just the continuity of the time of you know his education with his mother, mm -hmm. uh, asking him to because it was she was not only asking him to listen, she also asked him to repeat in many cases uh, the things that he had heard. Let me just ask this. Um, do you think, because uh, I always thought in reading the book I just mentioned from Cliché to Archetype that uh, 
Uh, McLuhan is big on the idea, and I don't recall it's been a number of years since I read it, that he was big on the idea of ekphrasis, that, that one art can influence another art, and if you write about or if you base an art upon another artist, you have that sort of passing of the baton. Uh, do you think that uh, his ideas about uh, art uh, were the basis for his ideas about the media? In other words, that the everyday existence that we have uh, is influenced by the media much in the same way that art can influence us. Maybe. Maybe. It's an interesting part. I, I should reflect on it now because I, I, I wouldn't have brought that... I think, I think Marshall had a lot of tools to think. Mm -hmm. he, he thought in the in geometrical structures. His famous tetrad. You know, the tetrad is just one, but there's many other uh, sort of breakdown as breakthrough, uh, uh, some of his jokes. Uh, in Canada, many were cold, but few were frozen. <laughs> many other things of, the nature, of that nature. Um, no, I think. Uh, He, would, he, he, he actually carried his absolute love affair with language into uh, his books. He just, I think he really, and he loved his own, I'm sure he was very happy with his own style. You know, he, was very, he was very proud of, of having found a way to break from the academic mold, yeah. which was required from him to remain a professor, normally. Well, now, um, he he died in 1980, just a few years after his sort of famous appearance in Woody Allen's film, Annie Hall. Um, did he die of a heart attack? And let's talk about his afterlife, how his uh, reputation sunk and has re-risen. Uh, what did he die of? I don't know. I still don't know. He had a stroke, and that stroke did not... Uh, happened a year and a half before he died. Mm. He must have had a second one because he died during the night. Uh, but I, I think that's what happened. But the first one I know of because I was with him at the time. And in fact, I was with him a week before he died. Mm -hmm. And he was fine, but of course he couldn't speak. He couldn't speak and he couldn't write. But he could certainly hear, listen, understand. Uh, think he was very good at it. In fact, still, but it was very difficult for him to express anything. Uh, and that was a week before he died. And so he, he died in his sleep. But uh, after that, well, the University of the University of Toronto genuinely tried to sweep under the carpet. But uh, there was an outcry. And uh, people as far back as Woody Allen himself wrote to the head of the university to say that it would be unconscionable not to pursue the direction of, of, of research and, and the thinking of Marshall McLuhan. And even at that, the university was very slow at getting, its, getting itself going. But it did promise that at the time especially with the newspaper and the bad press he was getting, and probably was going, it was going to do something about the McLuhan legacy. Uh, and during that period, among, I think we must have been 16 or 17 presenters of what we would do to continue the McLuhan work. And I was one of them. Um, and I certainly was the most, I would say, the most improbable of all of them. Many of them are rather serious persons uh, and, and genuine academics. Uh, and then eventually it was given to David Olson, who was the first director of this McLuhan program in culture and technology. Uh, David Olson and I were co directors, and I don't think we need to go into the details, but. <laughs> Our relationship was not entirely uh, adoring, but there were 
where we, we sort of got along. And the last time I saw him, I was really pleased to see him. So we, we don't hold any grudges. She was very different from me. Mm-hmm. Uh, but he was good at organizing. At the beginning, he was very good at organizing the local program, of which I would have been incapable because I was absolutely no good in those logistics. But he was good. He organized it well. I think he had some experience, which I didn't have. More like the ambassador of the place, and he was more the sort of the so uh, stupid. Uh, I'm being called now. What do you think? Should we should we do a, a continuation of this? I'm pretty willing to do it again if you want. Uh, we we can finish up in a minute or two. Just give me two or three more minutes, okay? And we'll okay. wrap up. Yeah. Well, okay. let me. Let me just ask then a final question then. Well, or just uh, what do you think the future of McLuhan is? Uh, do you think he'll have continued relevance throughout the 21st century? Yes, absolutely. There's no doubt about that. And also, he will be, obviously, he will, he will be considered as one of the forefathers of the, of the knowledge world mm-hmm. that we're into. And, how, and that he was the first to articulate it well. And so when you when you try to trace back, and sometimes it's useful to do so, so as not to live in only a perpetual presence, when you try to trace back where you come from, you need you need pointers, you need uh, markers. So it is a marker. Well, I want to thank uh, you for your time, uh, Derek DeCove. I will link uh, uh, to. Uh, a your web page uh, at, at your universe. I'll also link to marshallmcluhan.com. So thank you for spending about an hour talking about Marshall McLuhan and his importance. Yeah, I'm sorry that I've been dragged here because I'm enjoying it myself. So okay. anyway, to call me again, I'll All be right. ready. Thank you. Goodbye.